The Hinterkaifeck Farmhouse Murders, a century-old cold case. The year is 1922, on a cold and snowy evening in April the 4th, when an isolated town called Hinterkaifeck in rural and southern Germany would forever be haunted by the gruesome murders of the Gruber family in their very own farmstead, brutally bludgeoned to death. When a group of villagers had thought to check up on their neighbors, the Grubers, they half expected them to just be in the barns milking the cows, or in the kitchen sipping on their cups of coffee, or just playing with their dog. But no. When the Hinterkaifeck villagers opened the barn doors, they were greeted with an eerie silence and the horrifying smell of blood. As they stepped forward, the hairs on the back of their necks stood up. There, on the far corner of the barn, lay the slumped and lifeless bodies of Andreas Gruber and his wife Kazilia, their daughter Victoria, and their grandchild Kazilia. A mattock, a farm tool similar to a pickaxe, lay bloodied beside their corpses. When they searched the house further for any other family members alive, their hearts sank as they found both Joseph, one of the grandchildren, and Maria, the new housemaid, had unfortunately suffered the same predicament. There was no sign of the murderer nor anyone else in the surroundings, and yet chillingly, some of the villagers had sworn that they had seen light coming from the house and even smoke coming out of the chimney just that day and days before. The Hinterkaifeck murders would become one of the most horrific unsolved murders in German history. What exactly happened to them? Were they killed by someone who was already waiting in the dark corners of their house this whole time for months, ready to pounce at any given time? Let's find out. Our story takes place in the town of Hinterkaifeck, in a secluded and forested area in a rural part of Germany where the Gruber family resided headed by the father, Andreas, 63, and the mother, Kazilia, 72. Their daughter, Victoria Gabriel, 35, was a widower with two small children, seven-year-old Kazilia, the same name as the grandmother, and two-year-old Joseph, and lastly, their new housemaid, Maria Baumgartner, 44. Let's take a look back at the peculiarities noted by the family as far back as the year before. A few months prior to the murder, in the winter of 1921, some peculiarities within the house and farmstead were observed. This started off when the last maid employed in the farm had left abruptly just six months before. She had complained about the uneasy feeling of being watched all the time. She said that when she cleaned the house or did errands for the family, especially in the dead of night, she couldn't shake off the feeling of someone in the shadows watching her every move. It got even worse when she started hearing voices around the house, and not just in empty rooms, but it sounded like they came from within the walls. To top it all off, as if this wasn't scary enough, the maid had begun to hear footsteps coming from the attic, and that was the last straw. She then told Andreas about it all, going as far as saying that the whole farmstead was probably haunted and that evil was in the house. Andreas and the rest of the family were alarmed by this, as they had trusted the maid, and since she was also an essential part of the household, so he took a look at the attic and rest of the house. Unsurprisingly, nothing was found. Nothing was out of place, nor were there any strange things found in any part of the house. The strange noises and footsteps continued weeks after, and even though she told Andreas numerous times before, still nothing unusual stood out, nor were there any potential suspects. Fearing for her sanity and safety, the maid decided to leave right after. But even when she had gone, the peculiarities continued. Andreas even later revealed to some neighbors that he himself had started hearing the eerie sounds of voices and footsteps as well. He got paranoid and told the rest of the family of the dilemma and had all collectively decided to search the whole property. Objectively speaking, 
everyone was just stressed. And to add to this list, a few weeks later, little Kazilia, one of the grandchildren, had went missing for a few hours. This caused the whole family, and even some of their closest neighbors, to go into a panic. Thankfully, they had found her in the forest a while later after rigorous searching. They brought her back to the house safely and questioned her. Why she was there? What happened? And if she was brought by someone there? But little Kazilia could only shake her head and give the same answer to every one of their questions. She can't remember. Suddenly, a distraught Andreas felt a chill run down his spine when he looked over to their kitchen table and found something strange. It was a newspaper, one that Andreas swore he had never subscribed to, nor anyone else in the area for that matter. How the hell did a newspaper like this end up on their kitchen table inside of their house? Wow, talk about scenes coming from a horror movie. And it doesn't stop there. A few days later, when Andreas was about to retrieve some tools for a day out in the field, he found that someone was trying to break into his tool shed. The shed was supposedly locked from the outside with a huge, rusty lock. But Andreas found that numerous gashes were found on the metal, as if someone had tried to break the lock open by hacking at it with sheer force. On a separate occasion, one of the house keys had gone missing as well. Since the family owned only a few sets, it had caused quite a bit of panic among the family, as the thought of someone just readily opening the house and walking in, or worse, watching them from the shadows, at any time had terrified them. Just a few months later, in early 1922, after a snowstorm the night before, Andreas had once again come across an alarming discovery. He noticed a glaring set of footprints coming out of the forest and leading up to his house. Footsteps that led all the way in front of the door that he had now just opened. The scary thing about this was that there were no set of prints going back towards the forest, meaning that whoever had come into the house most likely had not come back out of his house. Talk about chilling. Andreas quickly shuts the door, locks it, wakes up his family, tells him of what he found, and asks if any of them had gone to the forest early in the morning or late last night. Unfortunately, no one had a clue, so they all proceeded to investigate the house and the area around it, the barn, attic, everywhere, but they found nothing at all. Andreas decides to call for backup, running over to his neighbor's house starting with Lorenz Schlittenbauer, his closest neighbor. He then told Lorenz about the mysterious footprints and how he was ultimately disturbed by how no prints led back out of the house. Lorenz offers Andreas some of his weapons to use for protection in case of anything, but Andreas denies the offer, making this the biggest mistake of his life. On March 31st, 1922, just shortly after the Gruber's new housemaid, 44-year-old Maria Baumgartner, arrives at the Hinterkaifeck farm. Just four days later, on April 4, 1922, a repairman who is scheduled to go over to the Hinterkaifeck farm arrives to work on the feeding machine, and yet no one of the Gruber's came to greet him or even open the house's door. He found it odd that the doors were locked no lights were on, and no one answered when he called out, except the dog barking from the inside. But since he had came to do his job, he didn't think much of it and proceeded to work on the feeder, which was outside of the main house. After fixing it, the repairman got up and was about to leave, but was suddenly stopped in his tracks when he noticed the dog that was barking earlier from inside of the house was now tied outside. He approached the barking dog, who was definitely not tied there earlier, and went to the door. He knocks again because this must have meant that someone saw him working on the feeder, but when he does, still no answer and all the doors were still locked. That's odd. The ruffled repairman goes over to Lorenz Schlittenbauer's house and tells him what happened. 
Both men and some other neighbors agree to go over and check on the Grubers and their farm. To what the repairman had said, the group arrived at the Hinterkaifeck farm and indeed noticed the locked doors and the dog barking outside of the house. What they also see are some of the lights that were on, as well as the barn doors being open. When they went inside the barn, the smell of blood and death greeted them. On one corner of the room, underneath all the hay, they found the four bodies of Andreas Gruber and his wife Kazilia, their daughter Victoria, and their little granddaughter Kazilia, all bloodied and brutally slaughtered, to the point that their faces were almost unrecognizable. The concerned neighbors quickly searched the area, and when they checked the house, had found two more dead bodies, that of little Joseph Gruber killed in his cot, and the housemaid, Maria Baumgartner, in her own quarters. What had added to the frightening sights of the dead Grubers was that in the kitchen, there were remnants of a meal being cooked, the used plates of someone who had recently taken a meal, and the fireplace had evidence of being recently lit just moments before. The group hurriedly contacted the authorities. The police immediately came to the area and closed it off but not before some of the nosy neighbors got a bit of a peek inside and may have somehow disrupted the crime scene. Upon requesting of their closest neighbors, the police had determined the tragedy to have happened on March 31st, just four days prior, on account of the local mailman who continued to deliver their mail and daily papers, but noticed the mailbox piling up for a few days now. Aside from this, some teachers from Little Kazilia School had also revealed that they noticed her absence from her classes recently. After further inspection and probing, the police had gathered one important statement in common from all the neighbors being questioned. They all confirmed to seeing smoke coming out of the Gruber's chimney the days prior, which means that between the time of the murders up until four days after, the murderer stayed in the house even after killing the Gruber family. That's right, folks. While the dead owner's bodies were left to rot, the murderer had made himself right at home. He slept in the Gruber's beds, ate their food, lit fires for the cold nights, lounged around, played with the dog, ran the farm, and fed the farm animals, and had even milked the cows. The police had come up with multiple possibilities for what happened one of which was that over the course of 24 hours, it was presumed that the killer was indeed within the Hinterkaifeck farmstead and positioned himself in the barn where he was able to silently lure in each family one by one without raising suspicion. Once after they were inside, the killer struck them in the head with the family's own mattock. After several blows to their heads, he put their corpses in the corner of the barn and covered them with hay. But if they put up a fight, the killer possibly proceeded to strangle them to death. Once he was sure no one else would come to the barn, he sought out the rest of the family inside the house and finished them off. Although the Hinterkaifeck farm was relatively hidden from the main road and relatively situated out of sight from onlookers, members of the Gruber family were quite infamous around the area. They were often a hot topic for gossip. In other words, they weren't the most likable family in their small community. It was said that Andreas Gruber, the antisocial patriarch of the family, was the enabler of domestic violence and that he would even regularly beat his wife, Kazilia, when things didn't go his way. Another well-known and more controversial rumor was that Andreas was said to be the father of his own two-year-old grandson, Joseph. Yep, you heard that right, grandson. Joseph, who was his daughter Victoria's youngest child. According to the rumor mill, Andreas was said to have an incestuous relationship with Victoria, whom he kept control of and had even forbade her to marry. Autopsies were done on the Grubers, headed by the court physician, Dr. John Baptist Amoller. It was revealed that Andreas's face was badly beaten to the point that his cheekbones were found to protrude from his shredded face. The older Kazilia, the matriarch, had shown signs of strangulation and had sustained seven blows to the head, leading to a cracked skull. Victoria's skull was discovered to be smashed with star-shaped wounds on her head. Seven-year-old Kazilia's jaw had been shattered 
and her neck and face were covered in large gaping wounds. The little girl's hair was also found in clumps in her balled up hands, while bald patches were seen on her head. She had probably not been killed right away and instead lay in hiding, too terrified and panicked to scream in fright. Authorities had come up with a list of suspects, though one of the few theories they initially went with was also the possibility of a drifter or a mysterious traveling man who made an unfortunate stop at the house. He could have wanted to try and rob the family while also seeking refuge in a rather isolated farmhouse while he was at it. This was eventually disputed though, as the police had discovered the family's money to be untouched, kept in one of their cabinets. The previous maid, whose name was not put on record, was one of the first to be questioned. She was called back again to Hinterkaifeck for questioning, yet she was soon let off as her story had matched what the neighbors had also told the police about her complaining of the strange sounds and footsteps she used to hear while she was still working there. Not to mention, the eerie feeling of being watched was what really convinced her to leave for her safety. Her family members had also attested to her being at home when this happened, and that she had no reason to be there since they had already hired her replacement. The police then went looking into another possible motive. Was this a crime of passion? Villagers had dropped the rumor to authority that one of their neighbors actually had an affair with Victoria Gruber a few years ago, and this was none other than Lorenz Schlittenbauer. The spotlight was placed on Lorenz as he was also the first one to lead the party going to Hinterkaifeck Farm on April 4th. And on top of that, whispers have also floated around that he was the father of one of Victoria's children, and had at one point asked Victoria's hand in marriage, but was unfortunately blocked by Andreas himself. He was eventually taken off the hook though, as his family had insisted that he was with them the whole time that the murders had taken place. Lorenz even retold the story of how he offered Andreas some of his weapons when he told him about the mysterious footprints a few weeks back. No other leads had popped up unfortunately, as the police have rejected the theory of Victoria's ex-husband being the culprit probably to take revenge on his father-in-law, Andreas, whom he supposedly did not see eye to eye with. This was scrapped since the ex-husband was said to have died in the war years before. A year later, in 1923, the farm was burned to the ground taking all the potential evidence and remnants of the Gruber family's demise with it. No leads meant that there was definitely no going forward with the case at all. Decades later, in 1999, the local police in Hinterkaifeck were contracted by an elderly woman claiming that her former landlord had information on the murders. An investigation was done, but it was found that the suspect in question had already passed. Another lead again in 2007 was brought up, when a team of police academy students used modern detection techniques to try and investigate. It was reported that the students actually managed to narrow the search down to one actual suspect of the murders, but upon careful consideration, the students had decided to not publicize the suspect's name or information. Despite being already deceased, the suspect's name was never revealed until now for confidentiality and respect for the living family members. Up until now, no other leads have surfaced, and at present, almost a century later, with all the potential witnesses and suspects having already passed on, the case has definitely taken a cold turn as a finality. Exactly what happened that night would never be known. The sad and horrifying case of the Hinterkaifeck murders remains open and will likely remain that way for years to come.